This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll make a start. Thank you all for coming to this event, an update on Peru 20 years on since the enactment of the uh, last constitution in 1993. Um, I'd like to thank ILAS for providing this uh, fantastic venue and also the Embassy, the Embassy of Peru for their support um, in organizing this event. Um, our three distinguished speakers this evening are, first of all, we'll start with Gonzalo Romero Somer, a PhD candidate in history from the Institute of Americas at UCL. And then we're followed by Paolo Drino, uh, a senior lecturer in Latin American history at the Institute of Americas at UCL as well. And then finally, Michael Kuczynski, um, a fellow of Cam Cambridge College at the University, no, sorry, a fellow of Cam Pembroke College at the University of Cambridge. But first of all, I, um, before we begin, I'd like to um, uh, invite the Ambassador of Peru to come up and say a few words. Uh, thank you very much to all of you who are here in the Peruvian Embassy. We are very happy to, to, to have these type of meetings. And I want, first of all, to thank Canning House and the Institute of Latin American Studies for the possibility of having this event today. Uh, the event today is going to, be, to discuss a little bit about our country, our Peru, our Peru, especially in the last 20 years. And by, for this, we have three Peruvians who are working in London. And I, I am I'm absolutely sure you are going to be very interested in whatever they want to say. Uh, however, I would like to stress now that Peru has, has gone in the last 20 years for a, a big revolution in the sense that many things have happened in the last 20 years. But the most important thing is that now Peru is a democracy, a country that uh, rule of law is the most important, and respect of human rights and the environment. At the same time, we have an open economy, economy open to the world, where trade and investment is an issue fundamental for us. And that has been a, the trend for the last 20 years. And, but all of what we are talking about is why do we do that? We do this because we want to give our people uh, a best life, the best life possible. As you all know, Peru, maybe 20 years ago, was 50% poverty. 50% of our population live under the, the, the line of poverty. Now, the, the, if you, go to, you see those statistics, you will see probably poverty between 25 and 28%. That is a big a chunk of people that now are out of poverty and are, in, and are increasing a very buoyant middle class, a new middle class. But that is also a challenge. It's a big challenge for us. We have two challenges. We have, as Peruvians, to try to get more people out of poverty. That is why our government calls inclusion, social inclusion. But also, we have the challenge of giving a much better way of life to this new middle class that is arriving. It means we need more investment, more work, more trade. We have to develop uh, infrastructure, and especially we have to develop and make a better education. Education is probably the biggest challenge that Peru has in the future. But, and how can we do it? Through many ways. Good governance is one of them, of course, but we also need the help of our friends. And when I say, talk about friends, I'm talking about the United Kingdom. We, we, uh, we have many things in common with the United Kingdom, and, uh, and we, it's one of the countries that will help us very, very much. Except now they are the second investors in Peru. They are very important in the mining and energy sectors. And I'm sure when they, uh, in education they can make a, also a, a, a big uh, help, because they are now coming back, with a, the, the British Council is coming back to Peru after a few years, it was closed. And that gives us a, a great opportunity to, to work together. At the same time, the, the two houses of parliament in the United Kingdom approved uh, the trade agreement 
but uh, between Peru and, and Colombia with the United, uh, European Union. And the Queen will should, in less than a month, sign to the Privy Council the promulgation of the, as law. So we are very, very happy about that situation. But I don't want to talk more. I believe uh, our, my three colleagues have a lot of things to, to say about Peru. But I want to finish with, an, uh, with a more, more light note, in the sense that, as you know, Peru has, uh, is very well known now because of gastronomy. And you have very good restaurants in London, now really open in the last few, few months and years. But uh, everybody knows what Pisco means and what Pisco Sour means. So after this, this, this meeting, we will have to pick us out for you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Ambassador. If I uh, can tell you that. Sure. Um, well, um, thanks uh, to Cunning House for organizing this event and um, everyone for being here. Um, I'm just going to give a brief summary of the past 20 years, and uh, hopefully Paolo and Miguel will be able to offer a more in-depth an uh, analysis. Um, it is indeed necessary to go back 20 years to understand the Peru of today, and perhaps a few years more. Uh, the beginning of the 90s was a time of uh, terrorism and hyperinflation, and as the crisis became more acute, political forces realigned and the party system of the 1980s began to weaken. Uh, but the Peruvian right, in the form of Fredemo, seemed reinvigorated. It had a well-known candidate uh, in Mario Vargas Llosa and a political program that seemed to resonate with part of the population. Um, like them, the party blamed the Peruvian state for all, for all of the failures of the preceding decades. Um, it wished to transform the state from an inefficient and weak apparatus to one which would be uh, minimal but efficient and strong, and which would be separated from the economy. And yet the failure of Fredemo to win the elections and the victory of an unknown candidate, Alberto Fujimori, are well-known stories. Uh, Fujimori exploited general discontent by attacking the discredit, uh, discredited traditional po political parties. Um, he did not present a political program, uh, with the exception of a few generic slogans, um, and he was seen as an alternative to the uh, draconian measures presented by Vargas Llosa, who was considered a bit too sincere when it came to explaining his economic policies. Um, his final victory, therefore, symbolized the crisis of all parties and a new political era. Um, when Fujimori won, he surprised many by applying the same economic program which he had attacked uh, months earlier. As a Fuji shock was announced, prices of basic necessities increased and unemployment soared. Uh, unions marched, but like the political parties, they were also in crisis. Uh, but the reforms went uh, beyond the stabilization program. The economy was liberalized, foreign investment favored, and public spending reduced. Uh, these actions were celebrated by the International Monetary Fund, and Peru was once again welcomed into the uh, international financial community. Um, in sum, a new liberal program, based on the Washington Consensus, uh, was applied. It was a pendulum-like uh, pendulum reaction to the events which had taken place two decades before, when Velasco tried and failed to develop Peru by applying an import substitution model. Um, the fight against terrorism was another challenge. Events such as the bombing of Tarata and the assassination of social activists like Maria Elena Moyano by the Shining Path had instilled fear within the population. Um, here, the government used extreme measures which were not compatible with the rule of law. The, the Grupo Colina, the squad whose purpose was to condu uh, conduct low-intensity warfare against the Shining Path, became responsible for a number of human rights violations. Uh, the fight against terrorism was also consolidated, uh, also consolidated a strong relationship between the government and the armed forces, a relationship which was made possible by the obscure figure of Vladimir Montesinos, who had become Fujimori's uh, advisor. Um, while this relationship enhanced the freedom of the armed forces to fight the insurgency, it also made possible the events of April the 5th, when Fujimori carried out an auto coup after accusing Congress of, of obstructing his reforms. Um, the Constitution was put on hold, Congress dissolved, and opposition figures arrested. Although his actions had the support of domestic public opinion, international reaction was negative. Hence, Fujimori attempted to restore some, some sort of uh, constitutional order through the creation of the Democratic Constituent, uh, Const Constituent Congress. With the, uh, without the ability to negotiate, most of the political parties of the 1980s decided not to participate in the elections, deepening the crisis of the political parties. Uh, by imposing an anti-institutional and anti-political party mentality, and with the election taking place shortly after the capture of Abimel Guzman, Fujimori won a resounding victory. 
a new constitution was crafted, which was not necessarily better than the previous one, but uh, which provided a political exit for the coup. Um, it also allowed for his re-election, which was duly achieved in 1995, the year of the Senepa War, a short conflict with Ecuador. Uh, but the result of the peace process was only formalized in 1998, and Fujimori was not negatively affected by it. He was against a formidable figure, Javier Perez de Cuellar, uh, the former Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, his prestige, however, was not enough to defeat Fujimori, who was seen as a figure who had brought peace and stability to Peru. Um, but it was his decision to run for an un un unconstitutional third term in the year 2000 which created real opposition. Um, after the Japanese embassy hostage crisis of 1997, which ended after a successful siege, uh, the threat of terrorism had waned. The Asian economic crisis of 1998 worsened an already stalling economy. Uh, in some, there was order and less fear, um, but ever-increasing unemployment and informal informality. Hence, his candidacy quickly polarized the Peruvian population. Um, the opposing candidates were many, but only one of them, Alejandro Toledo, survived the attacks of the regime and managed to unify the opposition. And the electoral fraud was largely suspected, and international observers insisted that there were not enough guarantees to assure a clean electoral process. Toledo withdrew his name, his name from the ballot in the second round, and Fujimori assumed power from, for a dramatically short third term. Um, the day he took office, Toledo led the Marcha de los Cuatro Suyos, which uh, showed a growing resistance towards uh, Fujimori. This, together with a video in which an opposition congressman, congressman was seen receiving stacks of dollars from Vladimir Montesinos, uh, ultimately led to his downfall. Corruption, which had been widely suspected during the last decade, could now be proven. Amidst uh, growing domestic discontent and growing to international pressure, by now also from its former ally, the United States, Fujimori announced that he would step down and call for new elections. He also tempt, uh, attempted to distance himself from Montesinos, claiming that he had no knowledge of his actions, an argument that is still believed by many Peruvians. Uh, the crisis reached a climax in November 2000 when he announced his resignation by fax from Japan. Um, the man who succeeded him, Valentin Paniagua, was to lead a transitional government until new elections were held. But despite his short staying power, he did uh, carry out import important actions such as the Truth and Recon uh, Reconciliation Commission. It would later conclude that the fundamental cause of the armed conflict of the 80s and 90s was the Shining Path's decision to take up arms, and it also blamed the Shining Path for being responsible of the majority of the human rights violations. Yet the document remains controversial and still polarizes many Peruvians as it is systematically attacked by the media. Another important action was to eradicate the corruption which had flourished during the preceding decades. Uh, exemplary measures, almost absent in all of Peruvian history, were taken, and former ministers, congressmen, and generals were imprisoned, all of them close to the former president. After this short but important period of transition, Toledo arrived at the presidential palace. Uh, while his arrival officially uh, represented a break with the uh, authoritarian past, it also re represented a continuity in the sense that Peru's economic model remained unchanged. Um, he vowed, however, that within these parameters, he would fight to eradicate poverty and promote social inclusion. Um, and despite a growing economy um, during his term, um, some of these ex expectations were not fulfilled. Um, hence, the cycle of regional conflicts begins, um, in which Peru's regions express their discontent towards the liberalization of the market. For instance, in June 2002, the residents of the province of um, Arequipa protested against the government's attempt to privatize the Egas Electric Company. Uh, protests uh, spread south towards Tacna, where another company, Ejesur, was also to be privatized. Shortly afterwards, the whole of southern Peru was declared to be in a state of emergency. Despite these measures, protests continue, uh, continued and the government was forced to change course. But despite this, the economic model remained in place and even deepened, with negotiations for a free trade agreement with the United States beginning two years later. Um, these regional demands were also accompanied by a growing call for greater po political autonomy in a historically centralized country. Um, a decentralization framework law which called for some responsibilities to be transferred to local entities was passed in 2002. But although this laws mark a step in the right direction, regional governments still face several difficulties. Some of this stem from the crisis of political parties themselves. Fragmented with lower organ organizational capacity, the political parties that appeared in post Fukimori Peru were not national parties. Hoping to change this, in 2003, a political party law was approved, as it and as it tends to happen, the law which had 
many detractors for not being uh, rigorous enough exist in theory but was not a part in practice. Hence, in 2006, 36 political parties managed to participate in the national elections and national political parties won in only four of the 24 regions. Um, this trend continued with the return of Alan Garcia to the presidency in 2006. Uh, remember, for a disastrous first government, Garcia nevertheless managed to take advantage of an electoral process in which Ollanta Humala was seen as too radical and Lourdes Flores too liberal. Um, yet despite promises of representing a middle way between the two extremes, the Garcia government mant maintained existing economic policies and openly confronted those who opposed him, accuse accusing them of being enemies of development. Um, certainly, macroeconomic growth uh, grew um, uh, thanks to an increasing demand for Peruvian mineral resources. Given that most of these are exploited by foreign concessions, there were fears that the 2008 economic crisis would signify the end of this boom. However, such fears did not become a reality, but they have given way to a false sense of security and, unwi uh, and unwi unwillingness to diversify the economy amidst irresponsible rumors that Peru is now immune to foreign crisis. Um, Peru's willingness to sign free trade agreements continued, and negotiations were started with the European Union. But under Garcia, social conflicts also intensified. In 2009, after months of unrest, uh, residents of the uh, province of Bawa occupied the Central Road after laws were passed which allowed for the exploitation of mineral and oil resources. After declaring a state of emergency, citizens clashed with police, resulting in several uh, casualties. The Baguas, as it came to be called, once again represented the clash between the necessities of the export model and the rights of local communities, uh, which are yet to be resolved. Um, we finally arrived at the current government of Ollantumala, elected on a left-wing platform and who represented a growing wish for change in the part of Peru's provinces. Uh, but despite some social programs, he, ha he has been unwilling to make substantial changes in the existing order, and all of his economic <coughs> policies remain solidly pro-foreign um, pro -foreign investment. The social conflicts which he vowed to resolve remain, despite the passing of a law of prior consultation. The case of Conga is reflective of this. Um, yet the right continues to attack the government by insisting that, re that a return to um, a statist policies uh, is only a matter of time, where the left accuses him of being in the hands of the wealthy. In Congress, uh, he has had to deal with a, a, an APRA party that wishes to discredit cur current corruption proceedings against Alan Garcia. Fujimoristas, on the other hand, attack him for not pardoning Fujimori, who in 2009 was found guilty and sentenced to 25 years in prison for human rights abuses. Although much of the population still supports him and is against the sentence, the ruling showed a rare independence on the part of the judiciary and set a precedent that former heads of state could be held responsible for disregarding the rule of law. Um, these attacks have once again resulted in low approval ratings despite solid economic growth. Uh, but a legitimate criticism is that this growth has not, has not resulted in a more efficient state. Uh, most Peruvians complain of a growing sense of insecurity uh, and educational figures show Peru at the bottom of the table compared to other Latin American countries. Uh, economic growth by itself then will not solve Peru's political or social challenges. Um, finally, a few days ago, the International Court of the Hague gave its ruling on a Peruvian-Chilean uh, maritime dispute. The result has been held by some Peruvians as a victory, by others as a defeat. Um, but its real importance is that Peru has finally settled all of its boundaries after almost 200 years of political existence. As such, all ghosts should be left behind and eyes should be uh, set on the future. For although Peru has made important strides in the past 20 years, it is still at a crossroads in which it has to decide which path to take to transform its impressive economic growth into true development. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gonzalo, for providing a concise uh, overview of the politics of the past 20 years. I'd hand over now to, uh, to Paolo, who will um, build on this and um, providing a milieu for the current political situation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so at the end of the 1980s, whoo, sorry, got the light in my eyes. Uh, so at the end of the 1980s, Peruvian historian Alberto Flores Galindo, the most gifted historian of his generation, summed up his diagnosis of Peruvian society in the title of an essay, República sin ciudadanos, a republic without citizens. This diagnosis was fully confirmed by the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission on Peru's internal armed conflict, which pointed to the ways in which the conflict both reflected and reproduced the exclusion from full citizenship of a large proportion of the Peruvian population. Last year, 
2013, Alberto Vergara, perceptive young Peruvian political scientist, currently at Harvard, published a collection of essays titled Ciudadanos sin República, Citizens without a Republic, inverting Flores Galindo's original title. For Vergara, Peru in 2013 had more citizens than it had ever possessed. Some are rich and some are poor, but exclusion from full citizenship has been significantly reduced since the late 1980s by virtue of the effects of economic growth. For Vergara, the main problem Peru faces today is the quality of its institutions. Without strong institutions, Vergara argues, the gains from economic growth will always be at risk and the quality of Peruvian democracy will remain suboptimal. So these two titles and diagnosis of Peruvian reality, as Mariategui would have put it, point to important developments, not only in the social sciences in Peru, but also in the economic, political, and social spheres. And I, I'll address these here briefly. So my main argument, to the extent that I have one, is this. Despite a booming economy and the general perception that the country is on the right track after many decades of economic and political mismanagement, Peru remains, a sociologist Julio Kotler has recently suggested, a post-Fujimori society. That is to say, a society in which the key terms of economic and political reference are still those that were set during the authoritarian regime of Alberto Fujimori. While on the, one, on the one hand, this may account to some extent for the macroeconomic stability that Peru has en enjoyed for over a decade and for the impressive GDP growth that it continues to post, there are many signs that the post-Fujimori settlement, characterized by political deinstitutionalization and a significant decree degree of unaccountability from powerful political and economic actors, presents a number of pro problems for both sustaining economic growth in the medium to long term, and perhaps increasingly importantly, for improving the quality of Peruvian democracy and addressing Peru's perennial problems of poverty and high levels of inequality. Perhaps one major development or departure from past trends in the last 20 years is the sense that continuity rather than abrupt change is the order of the day. In contrast to previous decades, when the country appeared to swing wildly from one extreme to the other in terms of economic policy or political programs, today, by comparison, Peru enjoys economic and even political stability. The economy has weathered the current world economic crisis relatively well, as internal investment has come to supplement the drop, drop in demand for Peruvian exports. And the successful macroeconomic management that Peru has come to be known for is unlikely to change. However, a longer term downturn in commodity prices would likely have negative repercussions for Peruvian, the Peruvian economy, which may prove harder to address. There are no major immediate risks to political stability. Despite its failings, the administration of Ollantumala maintains a fair amount of popular support, although admittedly that support has dropped uh, recently. And it faces no real opposition in parliament or credible challenges to the status quo. Low intensity challenges from the drug trade and what remains of Shining Path, as well as from organized crime, will continue to pose irksome but manageable risks. Over the longer term, however, the failure of past and current administrations to strengthen institutional processes and to broaden and improve state services will continue to enhance problems associated with pol political disaffection and economic and social marginalization. Uh, so since Michael will focus on the economy, I'll say a little bit about politics here. <coughs> Peruvian domestic politics have been characterized since the beginning of the 1990s by what some political scientists call a non-party system. Political parties, including APRA, have become little more than electoral vehicles for political caudillos and opportunistic amateurs who fill the electoral lists. 
This has resulted in a legislative branch that has extremely low levels of legitimacy and effective effectiveness, and more generally, in an acute process of political deinstitutionalization at the national level, which is reproduced to a significant extent at the regional and the local level. This development is widely perceived, both by experts and by the general public, as a source of significant instability and as one of the key factors influencing the quality of Peruvian democracy. There are no signs that this situation is likely to change in the foreseeable future, and therefore the legit legitimacy of the legislative branch in Peru and of the legislative process will continue to erode. It means that the ability of the legislative branch to pass effective and much needed reforms in a number of areas, such as security and education, is highly compromised. The Umala administration has done very little to address this situation and in some ways has contributed to entrenching it further. In the 2006 elections, as Gonzalo already mentioned, Umala ran on a nationalist center-left ticket and lost narrowly to Alan Garcia, who was able to present himself as the candidate best placed to guarantee continuity in the management of the economy, while increasing and improving social spending and therefore addressing Peru's problems of poverty and inequality. In the 2011 elections, Umala ran against Keiko Fujimori, the daughter of Alberto Fujimori, now famously in jail for corruption and human rights abuses. Contrary to expectations, Umala moved firmly to the center, promising to maintain the macroeconomic model, while again increasing and improving social spending. However, since coming to power, Umala has been a political non-entity, a lame duck president from the very start, relying for his continuity in power on the still booming economy and the absence of any effective opposition, or indeed of social or political actors able to demand some degree of accountability or administrative efficiency, either in parliament or in the street. The situation has led to the widespread perception, which is not entirely unjustified, that real power in Peru is held, and has been held since the Fujimori period, by a loose alliance of technocrats in the economics and finance ministry, or in the central bank, and by local and foreign executives in transnational mining companies and in banks, who, in effect, are able to veto any initiative which is seen to deviate from an economic model that ensures macroeconomic stability and a legal framework broadly favorable to mining and hydrocarbon investment. And there is also a growing perception that broad sectors of the media are deeply invested in maintaining such a veto. The mismanagement of a number of social conflicts that have arisen in the context of mining and oil and gas projects in different parts of Peru a mismanagement, incidentally, that has twice led to changes in the staffing of the executive branch, does little to dispel this perception. As a consequence, like the legislative branch, the executive branch is broadly viewed as a direct contributor to the continuation and entrenchment of a suboptimal form of politics, which severely impacts, again, on the quality of democracy. Given the absence of any substantive alternatives or proposals for reform or direct or credible threats to the status quo, there is little to suggest that this situation will change in the foreseeable future. Let me turn briefly to the international sphere. International sphere. Despite fears at the, at the time of the 2011 election that Umala would align Peru with Hugo Chavez and the Alba countries, Peru's foreign policy has like its macroeconomic management, remained relatively constant since the early 2000s. The main issue on the international relations front has been the maritime border dispute with Chile, uh, which, as Gonzalo already said, the International Court of Justice at The Hague ruled on earlier this week. This dispute over the maritime delimitation between the two countries and over control over prime fishing grounds was inflected by strong nationalist sentiments arising from the legacy of the War of the Pacific, 1879 to 1884, which Peru lost to Chile. The ruling of the court, which Peruvians have broadly welcomed, gives Peru sovereignty over close to 50,000 square kilometers of sea. However, Chile retains the prime fishing grounds that it already held. The result is therefore, arguably, an economic victory for Chile but a symbolic 
victory for Peru. However, it's unlikely that the ruling at The Hague will severely affect diplomatic or economic relations with Chile, which are tenser than with other countries, but generally positive. Chile is a major source of investment in Peru, while Peru, which has recent, recently matched Chile's total GDP, although it still lags far behind in terms of GDP per capita, is beginning to invest in Chile. And those investments are of importance to both countries. More generally, both current and previous governments have made efforts to develop a degree of international alignment, not least in the contact, context of the Alliance of the Pacific as an alternative to the Venezuelan-backed Arbor Bloc. However, assuming Peru's economy continues to improve and to compete more effectively with Chile's, for example, as the port of Callao, a major recipient, recipient of foreign investment and currently undergoing significant modernization, captures a greater proportion of trans-Pacific trade, tension is likely to remain a factor in relations between the two countries. Aside from Chile, the main issue on the international front is linked to the transnational drug cartels that operate in the country. Despite coca eradication campaigns and close alignment with the US, on, uh, with US policy on drugs, Peru remains the world's top producer of coca leaf with three times as much land in cultivation as Bolivia and of cocaine, with production of pure cocaine at over 300 metric tons a year in comparison to Bolivia's 270 metric tons. Now, the impact of the drug trade on Peru cannot be underestimated. According to um, calculations put together some years ago by drug expert Francisco Tumi, the illicit cocaine economy adds between 3 to 11% to Peru's GDP and represents between 15 and 75% of official exports in value. Now clearly such figures must be approached with some caution, but there is little doubt that the cocaine economy impacts on the broader economy in various ways, including through its effect on the exchange rate. And there are some reports, for example, that suggest that the cartels are funding the organic banana industry in the north of the country in order to camouflage cocaine exports. And more generally, there is enormous laundering through the country, throughout the country uh, of cocaine money. Drug money penetrates the Peruvian economy through different channels and at different levels, in corporate boardrooms and in street markets, but it also impacts directly on Peru's political system. At the local, regional, and national level, drug money buys politicians and shapes political agendas. The actual extent to which Mexican drug cartels or their local proxies influence Peruvian politics is unknown and perhaps unknowable. So far, at least, outside drug growing areas in the Amazon and particularly in the Vrai, Peru has not experienced the levels of violence that have come to characterize the drug wars elsewhere in the region either in Central America or the favelas of Brazil, or indeed in Mexican cities like Ciudad Juarez. Although uh, there have been of late a number of high profile assassinations and assassination attempts of mayors and of regional authorities. But the prospect of a settlement between the Colombian government and the FARC and the consequences that such a settlement could have on operations of drug cartels in Colombia may well result in the increased presence of Mexican cartels in Peru. And there are reports suggesting that Mexican cartels are already operating out of the port of Paita. And this is likely, therefore, to lead to an escalation in violence. It seems to me that there is little evidence that the Peruvian government has the capacity to face up to such a development. Let me turn now to the social sphere. Peru, as the ambassador said, is no longer as it once was, but poverty, both absolute and relative, certainly remain a problem. Poverty reduction strategies, including conditional cash transfers developed since the early 2000s in combination with high GDP growth rates, have been successful in reducing poverty. Poverty now stands at 27.8% of the population, with some 800,000 Peruvians escaping poverty in 2011 alone. Social programs now consolidated within the Social Development Ministry, MIDIS, and less beholden to populist electoral objectives as during pre previous administrations, are having a greater impact than in the past. However, some 8.3 million people remain in poverty according to Peru's National Institute of Statistics. And there is very significant variation in poverty levels throughout Peru, 
with poverty levels in rural areas at 56% and in urban areas at 18%. Although encourage, encouragingly, the rate of decrease of poverty in rural areas now exceeds that of urban areas. Now, this may owe to a significant increase of agro-exports, such as coffee, asparagus, organic bananas, from different rural regions and the associated increase in employment. Between 2001 and 2011, according to Lima's Chamber of Commerce, employment in Peru increased by 74%, generating, okay, sorry, um, generating some 4.7 million jobs, although this figure doesn't take into account the number of jobs that were lost. However, job quality and labor productivity in Peru remains low, even by regional standards. Um, and well, I'm going to skip this because I, I'm running out of time, but essentially the point that I want to make here is that much of the, the investment that is um, very welcome in Peru is still targeted at sectors uh, that require low, uh, low levels of labor, and that this, on the whole, there's very little to address employment needs. Um, despite this, it is clear that economic growth and the availability of cheap credit has had a dramatic impact on consumption patterns, and arguably on the quality of life of Peruvians of all sectors. This is not a phenomenon restricted to Lima, as the dramatic growth in shopping malls and the service sector in most of Peru's cities attests. The construction boom in Lima of the last few years has been fueled by demand from all social sectors, not just from the well-off, and it has radically transformed the urban landscape of Peru's capital and put a lot of stress on its uh, poor infrastructure, particularly transport infrastructure. So as a consequence of this, Peruvians of all classes are more concerned by criminality than by poverty or employment. According to a recent poll, 61% consider criminality to be the main problem that Peru faces. Such a perception points to the sense that the key institutions in Peru, and particularly the judiciary, which is viewed as the most corrupt of all state institutions, and the security forces, simply do not operate as they ought to. Some analysts have linked the perceived rise in criminality and a growing sense of insecurity to the econ economic boom of the last few years. And anecdotal evidence may indeed confirm this. A stronger connection, however, exists between levels of criminality and impunity for criminals and institutional failure expressed through corruption and judicial ineffectiveness. Although the Umal administration made its citizen security an important part of its program, little progress has been made. Moreover, the sense that corruption shapes most, if not all, inter interactions with state institutions is very strong. As a consequence, and this is a key concern, the state in Peru is perceived and indeed often portrayed in much of the media not as a channel for realizing the aspirations of Peru's citizens, but as the main obstacle to their aspirations. Peruvians of all social sectors systematically substitute state services, security, education, health, and so forth with private ones, even with and, as is often the case, private services are inferior to state services. This widespread distrust of the state is arguably one of the key legacies of the Fujimori political settlement. Am I out of time? Just about Okay, well, I had a final section on social conflict, um, which I'll skip and just conclude. So looking back 20 years to 1993, there is little doubt that Peru, broadly speaking, has made important gains. It is now a more prosperous and more politically stable country. But many, many problems remain, and the political settlement of the Fujimori years, with its deep political deinstitutionalization, means that many problems are exacerbated unnecessarily, such as social conflicts over mining investment, and others are not properly or sufficiently addressed such as poverty reduction. As we look forward to the 2016 elections and the likely candidates, there is little to suggest that the current situation will change for the better. Oh, thank you, Father, for that informative overview of the current situation. I'd like to hand over now to um, Michael, who will speak about the economy. Should I uh, do you help you with the... Yeah. 
<laughs> right, please excuse me for, I'm going to show a few slides um, and uh, the background to today's uh, talk is that, as you probably know if you read the newspapers, there's been a great deal of agitation over the prospects for emerging market economies of the Peruvian type. Uh, this agitation arises partly from what's been happening in the United States, monetary policy, partly by what's thought to be happening in China and so on. So that's very much the backdrop drop to the observations that I'm going to make. Um, I should just clarify a couple of things. All the figures I'm going to show you, all the graphs and so on, which are a bit of an eye test, actually, because I can't see them very well myself. Uh, the figures <coughs> come from the Central Bank of Peru, which has uh, perfectly reliable figures. Those that don't come from the Central Bank come from the IMF, which has pretty reliable figures. And those that don't come from those two sources come from the conference board, and they're perhaps the most important figures I'll show you, and they're thought to be highly reliable. Uh, I will stray into comparisons with a couple of other countries, neighboring countries, uh, not to comment on them, but merely to calibrate the Peruvian uh, figures. Right. Uh, Peru had a disaster which is very well known uh, starting in 1974. It's well known and poorly understood and lasted till 1992. Up to uh, 1974, it was growing at what I consider to be its conservative potential growth rate, which is around 5%. You can see the line there, That's, it's the heavy red line. The surrounding countries are Argentina in yellow, in yellow, Brazil in green, and so on. And you can see, if you have very good eyesight, that over the recent period, which is the 92 period onwards, Peru's been doing quite well, obviously at a very low level, because of this catastrophe that occurred between 1974 and 1992. Um, now, what's happened in the period since 1992 is that Peru has recovered its conservative 5% per annum growth rate. And uh, you can see that's the, the black trend line, uh, uh, sorry, the, the black dotted line. And the red line is what's been happening. And it's been growing pretty steadily off and on at 5% since then. Uh, this is perhaps the most remarkable thing that I will show you, right? This is what's happened to Peruvian economic output per unit of input. It's what economists call total factor productivity. It's basically how much effort you put in and what you get out, right? And the Peruvian line is, red, is the red line, right? And uh, it may be of interest to some of you to realize that the green line is Brazil. In Brazil, actually, over that period, which is basically the last 20 years, there has been no increase. This is attested by the conference board, for example. There has been no increase in the output corresponding beyond the input. In other words, beyond what's been put in, there's been no increase in the output. In the case of Peru, and I'll comment on that in a couple of minutes' time, the increase is very, very notable. This feature is not often noted in Peru. Um, the, one of the elements behind this is the fact that Peru, uh, after a tumultuous history of about 20 years preceding, has actually managed to control its two main macroeconomic evils, right? uh, inflation on the one hand and insufficient growth on the other, so as to bring them within a rather narrow band, so that inflation is now very rarely above 4%, which is about the right rate for Peru. The central bank would not agree with what I've just said, but I don't agree with them. Right? Uh, and uh, the... the uh, excess recession or insufficient growth in the economy, uh, the economy in Peru should grow 
at around 5%, and if you're much below that, you've got insufficient growth. And you can see that everything's been in the box, and since basically uh, around 2000, the economy in that sense has had relatively little discomfort. Uh, why? Uh, the first reason is a sort of macroeconomic reason, which is that Peru has started to save, partly privately, partly publicly, but the national savings rate has risen, and it's risen, it's the red line there, and it's risen not to Asian levels, but to, by Peruvian standards, and indeed by Peru's neighbor standards, are pretty good national savings rates. Right? Uh, the private investment, which is the green line, has risen along with the private savings. The state investment, public investment, has been rather dormant, and this is a point which I will return to uh, in, in sort of an appraisal in a couple of minutes' time. Uh, another feature in the macro management, which I think is particularly important and really uh, marks Peru out against not only its neighbors in Latin America, but in particular a lot of its uh, competitors in uh, East Asia and so on, is the management of the exchange rate. This is what is calculated as the real exchange rate. This exchange rate calculation is done by the Bank for International Settlements, and it is highly respectable. It's not the IMF or anything like that. Right? And what you can see, it's the red line, and it's effectively been flat. That's to say the combination of what's happened to the nominal exchange rate, the way the central bank has behaved, etc., etc., right, has produced an exchange rate which isn't too overvalued so that we all rush into real estate and isn't too undervalued so that we have far too much uh, profitability and investment. It's not rock the boat. The exchange rate is a, uh, a, a very nice achievement of the central bank. There has been a problem, uh, and the problem is that it's an open economy and it's an economy which has attracted a certain amount of foreign investment but the foreign investment has gone up and down. This is effectively the net capital inflow into Peru. And you can see that there was a period when it dropped very sharply and Peru had to, a burst of export surpluses. This is the counterpart to the balance of payments deficit of Peru. Right. So it's gone up and down. This is a feature which will, in due course, have to be stabilized. Now, public finance has been reformed. One element in this is interestingly due to Alejandro Toledo, and it is an unforeseen consequence of a very puzzling decentralization of the state that he produced. Uh, as a result of this, uh, there is rather too much public revenue being transferred to provincial entities that don't know how to spend it. And as a result, there has been a surplus of revenue over expenditure. And you can see that the revenue over expenditure line has gone up very nicely in the sort of way that it's gone up in previous decades in Asia. There is an element of this which may not have been sought for. The consequence is nice. The reasoning behind it is complicated. The red line is rising tax revenue, and the tax revenue in Peru is not as high as it could be, and I shall return to that in two minutes. Um, another structure of public finance point is that the interest payments on the public debt, which used to be a burden on the, on the budget because there was a public debt, right, have dropped down sharply because interest rates have dropped down and because the public debt has dropped down as the economy has grown. So the blue line there shows that it interest absorbs a very small portion of tax revenue. Would that in this country, the UK, you could show graphs such as this. Um, there is one aspect of this graph which I want to draw your attention to, which in effect sort of backs up some of the things that Paolo was saying, and which I find rather disconcerting, and that's public sector pay as a proportion of GDP, which has been basically stable for the last two decades, 
at 5%, and which I consider much too low, and is partly associated with the fact that the state delivers poor uh, uh, services to some extent, or is thought to deliver poor services. I do apologize for this, right? but the point that I want to make by showing you these figures is that Peru, although, yes, about 55% of its export revenues are mining revenues, so it is exposed to the world commodity price fluctuations, it is incorrect, quite incorrect, to say that Peru is one of these little emerging markets that are hanging on the coattails of the Chinese economy. Uh, so if you look at Peru's exports in, uh, uh, in 2012, right? uh, China is the same size as the EU it, as a market, a little bit bigger, both of them, than the US as a market. The Western Hemisphere, including the surrounding countries, are uh, the, the uh, including, of course, the US is a pretty big market. Brazil is uh, now a, a growing market for Peru. So Peru, it, it is uh, a raw material producing country, but it is quite diversified. And so uh, if China goes down the tubes, the, the United States is, may plausibly go down the tubes at the same time, but it might go in the opposite direction. And this diversification of an export orientation is a very valuable thing. Uh, there has been some talk about emerging markets being in bubbles and all of them resembling uh, uh, Istanbul and, uh, and, uh, and uh, such like. Uh, every time I go to Lima, I notice that there's more apartments for sale everywhere. Right? Um, and so I actually looked up the figures for property prices in relation to what was happening to GDP, right? And again, would that I could show you a graph like this relevant to this country, right? Uh, what's happened is that the property price index is high-ish in relation to where it was, but it's kept absolutely on track with GDP. That's to say GDP has risen, and as a result, property prices have risen. Um, I want to make a couple of points at the end, but I just want to show you very quickly, right, in comparison to its neighbors, what is happening in terms of social indicators in Peru. Uh, Peru doesn't imprison as many people as its surrounding neighbors, and that's usually a fairly good sign, right? Even if you have a rotten legal system, which Peru does have, right? The, the population in prisons is relatively small. Again, would that I could show you something like this for this country. Uh, the population in poverty right, is not as good as it could be, but it has been, as was suggested, uh, declining. And in particular, the equality of the distribution of income, which is measured by this thing called the Gini coefficient, and the lower it is, the more equal the distribution is, has been coming down, and Peru is now considerably more equal. Fairly reliable, this is World Bank uh, 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 figures, right? Now, uh, I just want to com conclude right, by discussing the outlook. Uh, and first of all, whether there is a sort of special Peru sort of <coughs> model which explains this remarkable result, which is that Peruvians are getting a lot more income out than they're putting in as effort. Uh, my interpretation of this is, first of all, that the macroeconomics has been fixed up. The macroeconomics in a variety of ways has been fixed up. Secondly, that 
Peru is a much more diversified economy than almost all of its neighbors, even though it is a mining country deep down. Right? But beyond that, uh, I want to stress in particular three, uh, f four aspects. Uh, if you go to a supermarket in Peru, they always insist on packing your things for you. Right? You're not allowed to tip them. And you look at the way in which the young chap is, uh, is packing the things while the cashier is checking that the addition of the machine is correct. And she checks. She is always a she, and he is always a he. And she checks whether it's adding up to an even number or an odd number, and she has mental arithmetic. Right? That sort of skill, even though it may not be coupled with uh, remarkably edu <laughs> high educational standards, they're pretty low at the moment, right? uh, is remarkable. So the first element, which I would suggest means that Peru can easily achieve 5% growth for another full generation, the first element is remarkable skill. The L example that I've given you is a trivial one. The, the second uh, element is a calculation which I did with a friend of mine, uh, Richard Webb, in, in Lima. We calculated how much time uh, a typical Peruvian working in the informal sector right, uh, spends between getting up and going to bed, which is not devoted to work. Right? In other words, what's the lost time? And basically, of an eight-hour day, you have to add in four, another four hours because of the chaos of the transport and the public services and so on. And that, of course, is a major source of potential growth. That's to say, with a little bit of rationalization of infrastructure, a little bit of rationalization of transport, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, a country that is wasting so much time getting back and forth from work is a country which has in effect, a, a very large addition to its potential. The, uh, Peru has a demographic window like a lot of other emerging markets. It's got now a, a, a small population of old dependents and a small population of young dependents. So it's got a lot of workforce. Right? The third point that I want to point out is that Peru has a taxing, a, a, an ability to tax, which is uh, completely underexploited. That's to say, the the uh, improvement in public finances has not begun to exploit the possibility of rationalizing and improve and increasing the ability to tax, and therefore then pay for much better educational systems, much better infrastructure, and so on and so forth. And the last point that I want to make is that all the evidence suggests that Peru has underinvested over the last 50 or 60 or 70 years. Right? There's been some recovery, but for example, in mining, in agriculture, there is scope for a lot of productive investment. You raise the rate of investment, and you will increase, rather than decrease, the productivity of the investment. For that reason, I see the thing as really basically uh, a viable non-cholera case of uh, um, emerging market. I do recognize that informality needs to be severely reduced. I recognize that in particular administrative law and the practice of administrative law is shockingly bad right, in Peru. It's slow and confused and the forms are ridiculous and so on. Uh, the public sector salaries need to be reviewed and the quality of the delivery of public services will not improve until they improve. Right? And of course, everybody knows that the educational investment doesn't match the innate skill of the population, which is a disgrace. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, Michael, for that presentation. We've now got um, about 15 to 20 minutes uh, for questions, so I'd like to open out to the floor. I'll ask, ask my colleague Joe to come round with us. Um, <coughs> sorry, just one here first. Is you just like to point out who, who you're directing the question to, please? Uh, uh, Michael, is it Michael? You probably won't hear me anymore, I'll speak loudly, but what I was wondering is what are the defining characteristics of a mature market that's called the developed economy is the proportion of middle class and the demand economically internally from the middle class. So US GDP has often been characterized as having 70% of it demand-wise coming from the internal demand. To what extent are we getting there in terms of Peru? It's a question that's often applied to China. The other question is can you give me a bit more detail on the likely patterns of investment into Peru by sector of what the drivers are? Thank you. Okay. I'll take a couple more. Yeah, we'll take a couple. We'll take three and then come yeah, around. Yeah, it's also to um, Michael Krasinski. My name is Keith Raffin. It, it's really, uh, he alluded at the beginning to the turbulence in the emerging markets, which you've seen over the last week. And um, I just wonder what his view is on the impact of uh, the US Fed's taper, the great unwinding of, of QE. Uh, one of our leading, uh, well, he, he thinks he is, and the FT seems to think he is, one of our leading emerging markets economists put Peru uh, in degree of vulnerability in group two, along with uh, uh, South Africa, Turkey, Indonesia, Chile, Thailand, and obviously the last 36 hours have shown what's happened in South Africa and Turkey. I'll take those two for now. Uh, right, sorry. Uh, the, the first question about the broadening of the domestic market and, and what has constituted. In fact, uh, not only is Peru's external exposure more diversified than the publicity that its trade with China uh, uh, achieves, it's, it's pretty broadly balanced between the main markets, but in fact, it, the, the growth of GDP, when you break it down between the growth in the domestic market in terms of private consumption, public consumption, investment or capital expenditure, and the export market is remarkably balanced. Uh, that refers in effect a little bit to, to, to what Paolo said earlier, that there is now a rapidly growing middle class, whatever that means, which basically, but it means people who, who buy some things on credit, who, who put curtains and white goods in their apartments and, and that sort of thing. So uh, it, it isn't yet possible to do the sort of major rebalancing that the Chinese have done from time to time between net exports and domestic demand. Domestic demand is still rather too s small uh, to, to wheel around in that way, and in particular the fiscal system wouldn't allow it, but it's considerably more balanced than just being a mineral export economy. And the, the, the contribution to growth is a, has been, a, a, this, the figures are out of memory, has been about two-thirds domestic demand, one-third net exports. Um, the investment patterns to come, right? Um, if we put uh, uh, mineral resource investments on one side for the time being, right? Uh, my own view is that there has been underinvestment in mineral resources for all sorts of reasons, which, by the way, are not only well known in Peru, they're also well known in Australia and Canada. They're exactly the same problems that uh, abound everywhere where you have hydrocarbon and mineral extraction. It's always a very difficult problem with a lot of local things. And I believe they're even having a difficulty in this country, somewhere in the south of England, with exactly <laughs> the same sort of problems. Right? But so if we leave that aside, right, 
uh, th there is a great scope for investment in that area, but let's leave it aside. There is, of course, major scope for infrastructural investment, uh, urban uh, transport systems, not just in Lima, which is, of course, a, a terrible mess. It's not, not worse than Tehran or anywhere like that, but, but it is uh, pretty bad. There's enormous scope in infrastructure. There is enormous scope in human capital investment, uh, in particular in the public sector and the schooling uh, system. And then there is, of course, enormous scope in all sorts of services. Uh, for ages, I have wanted from time to time with my brother to set up along the long, long uh, coast, uh, coastal road which goes from, uh, from Ecuador down to Chile and where the driving is appallingly dangerous and so on, uh, just set up rest stations uh, like uh, you'd have it in anywhere else. Right? All of those sorts of services, it's a wide open field for that. Right? And at the moment, all of these things are growing very quickly, that sort of thing. Um, so the, the investment driving patterns are this balanced demand, right? Ex exports and domestic demand. Uh, the taper question, um, uh, I, I think, if I may, I'll answer in two parts. First of all, is there a taper problem? In other words, is there, uh, will the, the change in US monetary policy and eventually possibly in European monetary policy have dire consequences for the emerging markets? Is there, that, is, does that issue arise? Right? Uh, about uh, 10 days ago, I wrote to the FT. Uh, they refused to publish my letter. Right? They, usually publish my letters, but this one they refuse to because they are in a sort of hyped up campaign to, dr to drum up a, a crisis which doesn't exist. Right? Um, it is certainly true that there's been problems with the exchange rate in, in South Africa, in, in Turkey and so on. What on earth uh, the Indonesian Minister of Finance thinks he's doing, putting up interest rates to prevent the currency from falling, it only makes it fall faster, right? I don't know, right? So uh, I think it's a very strange problem, right? I don't recognize it as a generalized problem. Uh, now, to come to the case of Peru, uh, an economy like Peru is helped if there is a little bit of exchange depreciation. It's jolly good for all the exporters, it's jolly good for all the, all, all the all profits and investment. So I don't think there's a real problem if the sol depreciates a little bit. Right? And I'm quite sure that the central bank will not lose its mind and put up interest rates to signal to everybody that the currency is weaker than it is and then start a run. I don't expect that to happen in the case of Peru. I also don't think that Peru has the problem which some countries do, and it's the case, for example, in South Africa, which is that some people have borrowed in, in dollar forms right, and are therefore going to be hit by a correction in the exchange rate. Uh, the dollarization in Peru has dramatically decreased and the banking system has been run very prudently, essentially because Peru has learned lessons from a disastrous 20 years, uh, 20 years ago. Right? So there's a lot, been a lot of learning. So to answer your question in a rather long-winded way, I don't myself expect uh, uh, that. And I don't think that George Magnus's uh, classification is correct. Time for a couple more questions. Well, I'll answer. Just wanted to say. Yeah. <coughs> Alan Murray, a member of the Anglo Peruvian Society. Um, I haven't heard the word manufacturing mentioned, I don't think, once this evening. And I just wonder with mining, income from mining, from tourism, um, from fruit, vegetables, and such like. Surely some of the profit 
that comes in should be spent on major um, manufacturing, new manufacturing area, and indeed services, which you were mentioning in the last answer. Um, so a question to Michael again. Um, just picking up on your point on the sort of balance between exports and domestic demand, um, are we not slightly ignoring um, the sort of importance of a healthy mining sector and strong exports to underpinning broader confidence, both consumer and business confidence, which sort of creates a link to the Chinese performance um, given the impact that can have on commodity prices and therefore create this sort of circle? Just, I think we'll have to do one more and then I'm aware that there's the Pisco Sours are on ice. <laughs> and I'm afraid I haven't been into India, I haven't been to Peru for 28 years. For 28 years ago, the problems of, of, of the informal sector were already beginning to be recognised. It seems from what you say that relatively little progress has been made on that, that front. Does that m make you think that this is a reflection of the distrust of the state, which was mentioned by one of the speakers, a deep-seated distrust of the state date, or does it make you think that it really doesn't matter in the light of what has happened to the Peruvian economy in the last 20 years? Uh, well, if, if uh, I'll, I'll try and be as brief as possible. Manufacturing, uh, I should have mentioned it because, of course, it's one of the brilliant successes. Uh, uh, you, you, if you look for baby's clothes in the United States or on the boulevard, Saint, uh, on the Faubourg Saint Honore or wherever, and you turn the label, you'll see it's made in Peru. It's a, a remarkable thing, and most of the polo things which have those funny little hieroglyphs on them and so on are made in Peru. Uh, there's scope for a lot more. I myself think, for example, that the wine industry is going to take off. There's, there's a lot of possibilities. There's a lot of possibilities in food, in food manufacturing and so on, particularly with a view to the Asian market. There is no possibility for milk products in Peru, which is a very big component of Chile's export success in that area. But the, yes, I should have mentioned the manufacturing. No. Um, w with regard to um, uh, the mining sector, its importance, and in relation to China, yes, of course. The terms of trade, export prices relative to import prices, do matter for a country like Peru. And there's no question that when uh, 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 international commodity prices collapsed at the start of the 2000s, it was not helpful for Peru. However, Peru is really more diversified than appears to be the case. Right? Uh, so certainly when the price of gold has fallen, that hasn't helped all that much, but at the same time, uh, hydrocarbon prices have stayed up, uh, etc. So it's not as dire a problem as that. Its interaction with China is a little bit more complex than it appears. Of course, China is a very big uh, uh, manufacturing base, but its surrounding areas are also. And Vietnam is potentially a very big customer for Peru, just as China was, because Vietnam is now sort of stepping into... into so so I, perhaps I'm being glaze-eyed and, and optimistic. Um, the informal sector, I'm sure the others will be able to answer a lot better than I can. Uh, Peruvian administrative law is a disaster area. Um, so, in fact, to employ somebody formally and abide by the law uh, is not entirely fully possible, and it's very... Uh, unfortunately, informal employment is inefficient and much lower productivity and I don't agree with Hernando Soto on this particular point. Right? But uh, it is terribly difficult without a reform, a, simpli a radical simplification of procedures. Alright, well, thank you very much. Um,
It's time for some pisco sours. So, uh, I'd like to roll before. Thank you. Very much.